Maybe about the general, there's a new one. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Miguel. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the session here. Can you hear me now? Yep. Here yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Good morning. Um, all right. So again, sorry. Uh, this morning we're going to be kicking off a session on the LCR two uh, for the installation. Uh, troubleshooting and set up an operation. Again, this is going to be a little bit deeper dive into the LCR2 installation uh, or LCR2 product. Uh, you know, in, in the past weeks, uh, if you've been attending uh, our workshops regularly, you know we've done some kind of high level review on our electronic registration as well as some of our other products. Uh, but today we're going to do a little bit uh, closer look at just focusing in on the LCR2 uh, this week. Um, Again, coming up in, in, in the next few weeks, we kind of have a, a mixed bag of, of other classes coming up as well. Uh, so next week on, uh, I'm sorry, in two weeks, June 23rd, we have uh, the mechanical and electronic calibration uh, training uh, class that we have coming up. So that's going to cover mechanical registration, uh, gear plates, calibration of the adjuster, and then get into, you know, how you uh, set up the calibration factor and calibrate uh, using the LCR2 LCR 600 and LCR IQ. So uh, we may not touch as much on those subjects uh, again in this class on LCR 2, uh, you know, hoping that you come back for the calibration section on uh, June 23rd. Um, after that, uh, we have uh, looked uh, at uh, PD meters and accessories coming up on July 7th, uh, and that followed by a deeper dive on LCR 600 on July 21st. So. Uh, obviously, we encourage everybody to uh, try and attend those classes if those are uh, subjects that interest you. Uh, and that will conclude kind of our section one of the LCR IQ, or I'm sorry, of the uh, LC University training. Uh, then in uh, the September, or I'm sorry, October, September range, we're going to kick off session or section two of the university, which is going to do a much deeper dive focus and some very focused classes on the uh, LCR IQ, the latest register from the controls uh, and the LCR IQ or the L IQ families. So uh, we'll be diving into those as we get into August, September timeframe. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand it over to our two of our uh, electronic technicians uh, look at controls. Uh, so today's class is going to be uh, run by uh, Atik Rai and Bill Westfall, uh, both uh, seasoned veterans here on our uh, technical services team. And uh, they're going to walk you through the LCR2 and give you a good overview on that. So I'm going to release the screen here. And Bill, the floor is yours. OK, so first of everybody can hear me clearly. I can hear you. Yep, I can okay. hear you. Yeah. OK, everybody see my screen? Good. All right. So. So probably for the next 20 minutes or so, I think we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit here about just the LCR2 installation and some general guidelines when we're installing this. So um, the, the first screen here that I'm showing up, really, uh, it, it's two different registers, but they do operate the same way. 
Uh, on the on the right, you've got the LCR2, which probably most of you are familiar with, with the selected increase on the buttons, the front door and all that stuff. Uh, but I do want to call attention to the LCR on the, the left here, the class one div one is also an LCR2 as well. Now in the picture, you can't see it very well, but the selected increase buttons are actually on the side. Uh, there's a couple of little switches. So the functionality of these two registers are identical. Uh, the only difference being the class one div one is an explosion proof housing for those type of applications. And then the, the one on the right is the class one div two, which most of us are, are familiar with, but they are both the same register just in a little bit different housing. So don't let that, uh, uh, don't let that trip you up when, when installing these, these registers. So, Today, what we're probably uh, what we're going to go through here um, is we're going to go through some just some basic components. What are what are some of the typical things that are used in an LCR um, installation? Then we're going to go through some optional components. W what additional things can can we include in the system? Uh, we'll go through some electrical checks. And then some wiring connections uh, and then a little bit about LCR versus LCR2 if we have time here. So, so this this is our pretty much our typical installation for most truck applications, and to that point, some stationary applications. As long as the uh, the printer is in a uh, a weatherproof environment, either in a, a box or inside of an office or something like that, uh, you've got the the electronic counter, the what we would call the LCR two itself. Um, the printer there in the, in the center, that's our typical Epson 295 slip printer. We do have other types of printers. Uh, this one is an impact printer. We have roll printers. Uh, we also have thermal printers as well that you can use. Uh, on the picture on the lower right, we're looking at basically our LCR cable group, which consists of a few different cables. Uh, the first one on, on the left of that picture is our power cable. This provides power from a power source in the truck, typically a fuse box, uh, back to the register itself. The center one with the little box is actually a 12 to 24 volt converter for the printer. All these Epson printers do run off of 24 volts. So with a truck system, you've only got 12 volt batteries. You will have to use this converter and that's what's in that little box. It's a 12 volt to 24 volt converter to power those printers up. And then the black cable uh, commonly referred to as the signal cable or the printer cable. Uh, this is what carries the signal from the LCR2 up into the cab of the truck to print out tickets or with a lap pad adapter, you can use this with a, a lap pad as well. So that is our signal cable. Some of the additional accessories, uh, you, you can have valves. Uh, the LCR can control valves. We can also use pod pulsers uh, or other types of remote pulsers uh, to, to send a pulse to the LCR2 uh, to get that signal to it. Common in a, a dual meter system on a gas and diesel truck, you would see a, a, a multiplex box or commonly referred to as a MUX box. Uh, basically what this is, is this is a print share device, so you can use two registers and share one printer, and it does have a port for a lap pad, so you can plug a lap pad uh, into it directly. It also does have uh, 45 capability, so if you're using a computer, you can use this MUX box to interface with the registers in a 45 mode as well. The protocol switch, uh, this is a device that is actually installed inside the register. Uh, if you look at it, it's got a small little toggle switch on it that typically sticks out the back of one of the ports on the register. So that way you can easily switch between 232 and 485. Uh, one, one thing I would wanna note uh, when installing these, you wanna be very careful that people understand that they don't wanna move that switch when the register is powered up by moving that switch when when the register is powered up does have a tendency to basically corrupt the software so we want to make sure that if that switch is there that it's understood that anybody that would be around it make sure that they power the unit down before that switch is moved from either 232 to 45. 
Uh, the next one there would be the ETVC kit for temperature compensation. Uh, basically consists of a, a probe, a couple of thermal wells. Uh, the thermal well up at the top with the little plug in it is for the weights and measures thermometer when they come out to do their, their inspection on calibration. And then the probe would actually fit into the silver one. Uh, one thing that's not pictured in here would be some sort of a, a thermal conductive grease, typically a, a copper grease that would go with that uh, on that probe before it's it's slid into the, the probe. Um, so that way we get a good reading on the temperature of the product as it's passing through the strainer. And and that kit right there, that, that flange would actually replace the front flange on your strainer. The next one here is a lap pad. This is uh, a, a common device that's used to set the register up, uh, configure it, set the settings up, and it's a little bit more uh, what a TIC will go into a little bit later as far as how that works and and going through some of the menus on, on uh, the LCR2 itself. And then we do have a remote display. Uh, we can interface with the remote display. This is one of the older ones, the old LCD remote display. Uh, we do have an LED, which is a brighter red one now, uh, which is an improvement over the, the older design. Uh, for the, those in the aviation that want to see the, the display from far away when they're refilling a plane, those are a good option for you. So those are some of the, the, the optional components that we have uh, for the LCR2. This next screen here is kind of a typical installation that we would see in a in a metering system with an LCR2. So in the center, you can see the, the, the LCA meter there, and on top of it, we have the LCR2. Uh, to the left, we have our air eliminator up on top of our strainer. Uh, there you can see the ETVC kit right on the front uh, with some conduit going from the flange uh, up into the LCR for the pro wire to protect it to make sure that it doesn't get cut uh, or damaged or anything like that, uh, just to give it a little bit of protection. Uh, then on the right, we do have uh, our valve. Here is a two-stage block valve, uh, so that would be attached directly to the meter as well. So this is kind of an overview of a, a, a pretty basic, typical installation uh, for, for an LCR2 application. So going through some of the electrical checks, um, make sure that the battery terminals, cables, make sure all that stuff is good, tight. Uh, a lot of times you'll see corrosion on the battery terminals. We wanna make sure that we clean that off and, and, and make sure that those, those connections are good, tight and secure uh, and not loose. Uh, make sure the battery is, is well charged uh, make sure that the alternator is also something that can power the system up and, and recharge the battery as well. Um, one of the things that we do say uh, when you're installing, if it's questionable, is to turn on every accessory on the truck. Turn your headlights on, turn your radio on, turn your windshield wipers on. Uh, any other kind of devices that would be pulling power from the system. And then check the voltage at your, uh, at your fuse box where you're going to power your register up to make sure that you've got the required 12 volts. The, the LCR doesn't take a lot of current. Uh, it, it's only a few amps at maximum for, for the register to, to, to work and power up. But we want to make sure that the voltage does not drop below that 9 volts. So if you're seeing a voltage somewhere, you know, around that nine, eight and a half volts or something like that, what'll happen right around nine volts is the register will just power down. So if you have a, a test light um, and, and you go out there with a test light and you're wondering why your register is not powered up and you use a test light, it's going to tell you that there's voltage there, but it won't tell you how much. So, so definitely a good voltmeter is the best way to go to make sure that you're getting at least that nine volts uh, back to the register. Um, again, if the truck has any kind of history of electronic problems, you want to make sure that you resolve those first. Um, I've seen it time and time again where somebody has an issue with uh, a, an electrical system on the truck. They install a, an electronic register and those problems manifest their way into the register itself because either a dirty power not enough voltage something like that so you want to make sure that any electrical issues are, are solved before installing the register 
and also inspect all truck the electrical connections the biggest one being grounds um you know if there's a hose reel that's already run to the back of the truck we want to make sure that all the grounds are good to make sure they're not loose make sure that they're not corroded um in going through a lot of troubleshooting on on register systems it seems like bad grounds on trucks seem to be the most common theme when we see problems with registers. Um, you know, either it's a loose connection or a dirty connection or a corroded connection or something, uh, something along those lines. So we want to make sure that everything is tight, secure. And keep in mind, there may be ground connections that you might not even see. You might not even know that they're there, but, but uh, uh, they could cause problems. And the positive or negative ground, um, I don't think you're really going to see any of those much, but what it is is it's just the, the, the current runs the opposite direction. They use the, the positive as a ground uh, on, on some of the older trucks and some of the trucks overseas. Typically what you see now are all negative grounds. So, uh, but just keep in mind that, that if you see something a little bit unusual, it may be that where they've got a positive ground truck instead of uh, a negative ground. And then uh, also with, with RF, uh, a lot of our cables are going to have shielding on them. Uh, basically, that's the foil that is, that is wrapped around the outside of the conductors of the cable uh, inside the sheathing. So, you know, you'll see this little bit of foil in there when you strip the wires back and stuff like that. But that foil there is to prevent any of this RF interference uh, coming from radios now. And, and we're, we're putting more and more uh radio waves into the into the sky now than we ever have so we definitely want to make sure that, that that we check those to make sure that they're in good working order and always use this seven and a half amp fuse uh we've kind of gone back and forth over the last few years between a seven and a half and a five amp fuse um honestly a five amp fuse is fine. A seven and a half amp fuse is fine as well. What you don't want to do is you don't want to go above that seven and a half amp fuse in there. So if you've got a five, that's fine. If you've got a seven and a half, that's fine. I would definitely recommend not using a 10 amp fuse. Uh, the, the one thing that you always have to remember too is that fuse is not meant to protect the register. What that fuse is for is to protect the electrical system of the vehicle or the installation from something happening in the register itself. So let's say you get a solenoid in the, in the metering system that shorts out and all of a sudden it's drawing a lot of current. Well, if it, if it draws over that seven and a half vamp fuse, it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna break that fuse and shut down the power. Whereas if you've got a 10 amp fuse or, or even if you don't use the fuse, now you, you risk that current going through the, the electrical system on the truck. So you want to make sure that you always have a fuse in line there to protect the truck electrical system. So here's a picture uh, uh, of a pretty typical installation. Here we've got the meter and register at the back of the truck. This is a, a pretty standard LPG bobtail. Um, you're pulling power up from the fuse box up here. Here's your fuse box. Here's your inline fuse right there. Here's your printer. Um, and then you've got your cabling running back to the, to the meter and, and the register system. One thing I would definitely suggest, uh, and in a lot of times it's the first thing that we ask when we're trying to troubleshoot a system, is using some sort of split loom or conduit uh, for the cable as it runs back. Uh, as you can see, this cable right here runs all the way back. Well, a lot of these trucks have dual wheels on the backs, which can throw stones and stuff like that up and, and knit cables and cut cables and stuff like that. So the, the preferred method is some sort of a flexible conduit. And the second option would be sort of a split loop that you typically see on, on cable inside uh, uh, the engine compartment or something like that. But definitely put it into some sort of a, a protective sheathing uh, to, to protect that cable a little bit better. Uh, for the LCR2 wiring diagram, uh, this is always a, a good uh, schematic, a, a, a good PDF. It, it is available on our, our website, so that way you know all the different connections. Uh, you know, you've got the power up here, 
if you're using a pressure transducer, the wiring is, is in this diagram here. Uh, DMS is actually even shown on this. Uh, your printer, uh, printer, how that cable is wired, this should come uh, pre-wired with these terminal blocks on, on the cable itself, so you don't necessarily have to uh, rewire everything unless you're going to shorten the cable up. Um, you've got your pod. You can you can uh, look at this diagram though, to wire up your pod, your internal pulser, uh, any of your auxiliary outputs. This is a really good diagram for schematics. Um, I think every one of the service guys has this handy. If it's not pinned to a bulletin board right in front of us, uh, it, it's usually within within arm's reach because this is a, a a really nice diagram to show you everything it is. The also the the other nice thing about it is if you look closely at this, it actually gives you part numbers of a lot of the accessories. So uh, if you look at the pulser here, it's kind of hard to read, but there's a part number right here on the pulser, eight two five nine seven. So it gives you if you've got a bad pulser, you know the part number to order. So this is a really nice schematic here as far as getting some information out, uh, and also to guide you through the installation of wiring things up. Some of the remote uh, electronic counters or, or the REC mounting kits. So we can pretty much adapt to just about every meter uh, out there uh, other than LC. Uh, the most common one are, are the Neptunes. Uh, the two drawings on or the two pictures on the left are the, the Neptunes with and without temperature compensation. Uh, so if, if you do not have temperature compensation, you're going to want the one on the top. Uh, if you uh, the the kind of a a bracket a that that will go up and around the the little bulb uh, the little dome on the meters and then a lower one if you do have temperature compensation and you remove that from the the Neptune meter you would use that one. The one in the center is our typical uh, eight one three six nine. Uh, the shaft itself on the left is hollow or is, is a hollow hex shaft, so it will slide over the shaft on the right. Um, and that that shaft on the right is also hex, so they'll fit together and uh, drive up into the pulser itself. So that's one for uh, the LC meter. But then you can see we've got ones for the Smith, we've got the Daniels, we've got Brooks, and then, and then to other Neptune meters as well. And here you can get a little bit better picture of these Neptune meters and how the temperature compensation and non-compensated ones would work. So the one on the left is non-compensated, the one on the right would be compensated. So you can see the two different types of, um, of mounts for those. And that's really the only thing that I have for installation. Uh, again, uh, a lot of the information can be can be looked at with the schematic. I would highly uh, recommend that when you're doing installations for the first time that you have this schematic close because again, it gives you a lot of the information as far as the wiring is concerned. Um, but just to kind of reiterate, make sure the electrical system is good on the truck. Provide protection for the conduit or for the cabling at all times. Uh, the one thing that I would also recommend is all of our printers now are coming with a static uh, strap or a static wire. Uh, be sure to install that static uh, wire on the back of the printer. On the back of the printer, there's usually a little lug on there that's got the grounding symbol on it. You would attach that wire. Uh, to the back of the printer there and just run it to a good ground either on the floor. If you have some sort of a pedestal that's bolted to the floor, you can run it uh, to the, the wire to one of the bolts that holds that, that pedestal to the floor uh, to get a good ground. And then also make sure that you guys are using the static straps provided for the driver's seat in, in the LCR2 uh, registers itself. Those Those will come with it. So uh, that's pretty much all I've got for, for the installation right now. Uh, we're probably going to spend a little bit of time, I believe, now on, on basic configuration and setup, uh, and I will let Atik run with that. Thank you, Bill. So let's see if I can share my content. Okay. Uh, 
can you can hear me? Yeah, I we can hear you. You just need to go yeah. into presentation mode. Okay, uh, I believe uh, I am viewing the presentation. Jeff, can you see the presentation? Uh, I can see the I can see your entire PowerPoint. Uh, so you need to just go go down to the bottom there, to the bottom right hand. Yep, click on that. Okay. Uh, it, it looks like you have dual reg, dual dual monitor going, and so okay. we're seeing both your monitors. Okay, give me one second here. Let's see if I can. Uh, I just need to switch my monitor. Give me one second here. While uh, a teacher doing that, does anybody have any general questions about installation for LCR uh, 2? Uh, mainly focused on what, what Bill had just talked about, grounding, accessories. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Uh, one common question that I get is, um, what would we suggest uh, uh, to protect the, the unit from receiving, you know, uh, high voltage, et cetera, and, and burning out the, the board, if you will? Well, of course, you know, Bill touched on it a little bit there earlier on, and, you know, every unit that we supply uh, comes with that seven and a half amp inline fuse. In fact, it comes with two, one usually for the printer and one for the LCR. Uh, that's really key in protecting not only the register itself, but the truck. You know, it, it's there for for a purpose. Uh, and I can tell you, of the thousands of installations I've been on, you know, there's been a handful where I've found where they don't have that, and it's it's definitely dangerous for 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 the equipment as well as you know the environment. So you know, it's tough to have that in place. So always make sure you have that in place. You, have, you know, when you run those cables, obviously make sure you know the, the cables are the lifeblood of the register. Without that communication between the printer and the register and most of our common applications, you know, you're going to you're going to have an issue. So always make sure that you run those cables safely and, and you know, in, in a way that, you know, uh, they're going to be protected uh, to where they can't, you know, rub against something sharp or something hot or, you know, uh, something that's going to damage those cables. You know, they're, they're pretty tough cables. They have a good jacket on them, but, you know, they're nothing against the uh, elements and the underneath, you know, side of a truck that can be a quite a hostile environment under those trucks. So make sure you protect those cables. Those are the two biggest warnings I have when you're doing the installation to, to keep from having some sort of short. Uh, does that address your question, Peter? Yes, thanks. All right. Looks like a teak, you got it. I'm going to let you take it off. We'll address some more questions here as we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, so we're going to get going on a LCR2 electro count, uh, just a basic setup and operation. So I'm trying to, the plan is to spend half hour on the PowerPoint and a half hour hands on. So I will have a real unit and the lab pad to show you guys uh, to go through some setups. So basic, uh, uh, this training actually the focus is to how to use the lab pad to set up the fields. Uh, there are two options there. Uh, you can use, uh, if you notice, uh, take a look at the, uh, the PowerPoint. We have the lab pad, we have the flash cable, and we can directly connect the flash cable to the board. Or if we have a lap adapter in the truck by the printer, we can also use that uh, to control the lap pad. Uh, the benefit of the flash cable is you can stand right next to the unit and uh, you know you can play around with the switch too and all that. Otherwise, you can have to sit in the cab and go back and forth in case if the jumper is in not the right position or something. Um, uh, this is just, uh, if you notice uh, on the left side, we got two different lap pads. Uh, the one on the top, which basically is a simple version, which is uh, mostly people use for the calibration purpose, only only for the setup. Uh, but they don't leave it in the truck for the driver to use it. The one at the bottom, which is a little heavy duty casing, uh, heavy duty coil cable, which can be used for the drivers for the daily purpose, for the everyday routine uh, making deliveries. Uh, of course, the price is a little more uh, the, the one in the bottom versus one on the top. And the one yes. on the right, uh, right side, we have the lap adapter and obviously the cable. I did put the part numbers uh, below those in case if you guys uh, want to order those. Those are the part numbers. Uh, flash cable is 81885. Uh, you can purchase from us or you can make yourself your own cable. 
If you guys were in the training class for the easy command setup and programming, uh, we talked about the, the same cable. So this is a simple cable, anybody can make it. Uh, just use a DB9 uh, cable. Uh, this is just a programming and operation. Uh, we're going to talk about how to use the lab pad basically. Uh, uh, talk about all those uh, keys and uh, some flow charts and uh, some uh, pump and delivery screens and some printing tickets and shift reports. Uh, if you notice, this is the uh, the uh, heavy duty lab pad. Uh, has a little colorful uh, with the keys, yellows and light blue, green, red stop, all those. Uh, but you're not going to see that in the other lab pad. Uh, these are some uh, 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 the navigation for the lab pad. Uh, you know, we have the numbers. We have the alpha up, alpha down, you know, A and B. It depends on what you're trying to type in. Um, and the SP is a special character. Uh, we're going to be playing around with that. And there's asterisk up there. Uh, these are uh, basically you can find this information in the manual too. Uh, you know, what's the purpose for this arrow up, arrow down, all those keys. And uh, M1, uh, a lot of people use MI, M1. Basically, it's M1 uh, from the LC3 system we use, so like a mode one. And then we have the M pound key. Uh, basically, uh, we're going to talk about, actually, I'm going to show you real life uh, how to use M pound key, how to use M1 key. And the clear key, the start key, the print, all those keys. We can really uh, take a look in our lab pad. Um, just want to quick talk about those two boards here. Uh, we still have people who deal with uh, those green board on the upper right side, 81920 board. And then on the left side, we have the uh, the newer style, which is could be 840404 or 5 or 840406. But if you take a look on the right side, we have two jumpers. Make sure J10 in the bottom position if you are going to use the lap pad. And if you have a blue board, either 840405 or 840406. There is only one jumper on the board it's called J10 has a A and B side. So the right side, which is the uh, for the lab pad for the left side is for the protocol. Just remember that. So like Bill mentioned, anytime if you have to change uh, these jumpers, make sure you turn the power down before you change the jumper. A lot of time you'll be surprised almost 50% calls uh, we get where somebody says, oh, I got a lab pad connector, but I don't see any display. Or I see some uh, uh, gibberish on the lab pad. First thing we ask, okay, what position is a jumper? Okay, the jumper is on the left side, which is the B position. Go ahead, pull the power down, move the jumper to the A side, put the power back on. Yes, I have the display. So 50% time the calls are just because we don't have the uh, the jumper on the proper position. Uh, this is just a selector switch. Uh, we can be talking about the selector switch. If you'd notice on the on the selector switch uh, plate on the right side of these modes, you have different uh, uh, menu you can get by using the select key or using the increase key. So we're going to be talking about those two. And if you notice on this selector switch, we have the kind of seal around. And in case if you have to do a complete setup, Complete mean you have to go from start from scratch. Then you must cut the seal, remove these four screws, and flip the switch upside down like six o'clock position we call calibration position. If you don't do that, uh, depends if your secure is locked or unlocked, you can do only limited stuff, only limited stuff. But if you really want to program the entire unit, you must remove the plate and flip the switch to six o'clock position. Uh, this is the basic uh, uh, top level menu, which actually we could be going through uh, this menu, so I don't need to spend time here. Um, these are just the navigation uh, talk about how to use those, uh, you know, arrow left key, arrow right key, all those keys. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I'm going to be showing you guys anyway live on the lab pad how to use these keys. Now, this is uh, the basic. Uh, you know, in if you set up the LCR two, the first thing uh, you want to get to the general setup, because this is where all the basic information is. You know, you set up your date and time. It's very simple because as long as you don't have any pending ticket, if there's no pending ticket and the switch is a six o'clock position, 
you can easily uh, change, modify anything you want to. And um, going forward, if you notice, we have the date and time and all that stuff. We also have the sales number, ticket number. Um, also, you know, the ticket number is not that everybody usually have it in their system. Sometimes they do not use any printer. Sometimes they have a printer, but they don't want to uh, get the ticket number to get printed out on a ticket. You can always uh, set the ticket to zero, so it's not going to, uh, you know, accumulate the ticket number. It's going to stay as a zero. Uh, I want to talk about the no flow timer. Uh, this is actually one of those very common calls for somebody to say he was making a delivery and he was sitting waiting to move to a next tank and the delivery you know, ticket got printed. Obviously, it was set to 180, which is three minutes. And if you set to any other thing other than 180 and above or zero, you will have obviously more time, but you'll also get the a message on a ticket depends what ticket format you have a multiple delivery at one side. So uh, we will talk about those uh, tickets too. Uh, a lot of time people says they do want a ticket which is not going to print the message, but there are cases which they want to print the message. Uh, in the same under the general setup, we have the preset type and all that. Uh, very common calls also for the preset, they said, uh, you know, preset is not even set up as a preset. It's set up as a none, or if it's a, a, a compensator delivery or net delivery, and somebody still set it up for both. Because the thumb rule is, if you set it up the, for the just say example, LPG, you want to make sure the preset type is for net only, because you don't want to use the gross anyway. And these are the preset type, uh, which is if you are, making a delivery to the like a custody transfer, you go to door to door, everybody is going to request different preset. Like if somebody says, okay, give the 50 gallons or 100 gallons. You can set to a clear uh, where you make a delivery, just say for 50 gallons, and you go to the next door, it will clear automatically. But if you think you can be doing uh, batches for like 50 gallons for 20 tanks, you can set the preset type to retain, that will, it will retain the value that's 50 gallons. Um, there's some header. You can uh, add your company address, uh, you know, phone number, anything you want to. Um, it's up to you. Uh, again, depends the ticket format because you can put the information if you don't have the proper ticket. It's not, uh, there's, uh, you may get confused that you just added the header information, but it's not printing on a ticket. Uh, because you need to know the layout of the ticket. Uh, we do have examples on our uh, lcmeter.com under public FTP, those examples. Uh, the last one on this slide is uh, print gross uh, parameters and the volume corrected message. Those are for the net delivery. Uh, there's a 50-50 ratio. We have people that do like, uh, you know, uh, compensated deliveries. Uh, some, they do want to print the, uh, these messages and some of them they say we don't want to print the message because customer get confused because they see the net delivery they also see the gross delivery so it's just pretty much uh, is a option for you to pick uh, this is the next we're going to go over the system calibration also uh, system calibration uh, basic information uh, if you just started from the top the, the most important the system calibration is a printer the ticket OK, this is another call. Somebody want to set up the printer. Either it's a ticket, yes or no. If you set the ticket as a yes, automatically you have to use the printer or the unit will not reset. This is a very common call, very common call. Almost every day we get called. Somebody says, uh, I'm trying to start the delivery, but it won't reset. OK, do you have a printer? Yes. Do you have a ticket in the printer? No. Well, that is a problem. Put a ticket in the printer. And also, if somebody has an issue resetting the system, we can always uh, you know, set the ticket to no just to test the system without the printer. If without the printer, you can reset it, then we know the issue was the printer because printer is not communicating with the system. It's very simple. Um, when I talk about the printer type, uh, these are different uh, uh, printers. Uh, you know, most common is a slip printer. We have a roll printer. You can use Okidata and some other printers. Uh, I have a next slide 
uh, I can show you some pictures. Uh, uh, next, I want to talk about uh, on this only two things here. Uh, the unit of measure, gallons, liters, whatever uh, you got, like the most common is the gallons. And obviously, in uh, other part of the world, they use liters. And the decimal uh, depends if it's like aviation, we use a whole. If it's custody transfer, we use tenth. And there's some other options. I want to jump over to the, the temperature. Now, over here, don't get confused. If you notice under the right left side of the 76, there's a dash. It's not negative. It's just my cursor. You'll be surprised people call that I have a negative 76. It's not negative sign. It's just a dash. So that's your uh, temperature. Now, uh, especially for the LPG market, uh, if they're doing calibration, if they have some uh, uh, some issue when they are doing the calibration and they put a, a calibrated uh, to probe next to the the LC probe, and if there's a, a smaller different, you can set it up up to so much, like a half a degree. But you cannot set it up uh, a degree or two degree. You cannot just adjust those things. Uh, we recommend that if you see, uh, you know, there is an issue with your probe, that uh, you know it is failing uh, compared to the uh, calibrated uh, weight and measurement probe, you must replace the probe. I want to talk about the next slide here, flow reaction. This is very common uh, where somebody set it up. They feel, you know, all these fields the first time they start the delivery, but everything's going negatives. OK, in that case, well, this is where you need to change the flow direction. Basically, a matter of bringing the cursor, press enter, use the arrow up key to scroll to flip from left to right or right to left. Very simple. I want to talk about the LCR uh, number 250. This is a default number. Uh, if you're not using a third party handheld, you don't need to worry about this number. But if you are using a, any handheld, uh, because a lot of handheld, which I've seen it, uh, mostly they use node one and two. They do not use 250, but there are some cases they use 250. I worked with one yesterday, one customer, they were using 250 with their handheld. But majority is one and two if you are using the uh, third party system. Uh, just give you one quick if somebody like if this is a very common call again. They are using just say, a customer using a handheld unit. They say we cannot communicate with the LCR2. In our you can talk to anybody, any uh, four of us. The first thing we're going to ask, what is the node address? Oh, I don't know. OK, let's take a look. And on the LCR2, we have node 250. What is your tablet or your uh, system uh, supposed to have? It says node one. OK, let's change this to node one. And that's it. That is the problem. This is a very common call if somebody using a third party system. Um, the very last slide, I want to talk about the calibration number. Very handy number. If you want to get into the factory setting, you have to use uh, this number. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to use this number. Uh, these are the printer I just talked about. We have the, uh, you know, EPSA 295, and then we have the a few other printers which can be used, but the most common printer uh, which we've seen the most is Epson roll printer or slip printer. Uh, this one is the thermal printer, the one at the Epson TM uh, T88. Uh, this is thermal printer. So you're not going to have multiple copies. It's going to be just only one hey. copy. Hey, this is Jeff. Sorry to interrupt you. Hey, I did want to step in here while we're talking about printer types here. Uh, I know some of you that are on this line have probably uh, been bit by this already, uh, but the company that bought the what's showing up here as the Axiom Blaster printer, which eventually was bought by Cognitive, uh, they did go out of business uh, and basically discontinued that printer line altogether. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of large uh, customers here in the US that were using that printer. Um, and so it kind of left us in, in kind of a, a, a predicament. We didn't sell the printer. Uh, it was being provided by third parties uh, and otherwise, but we didn't have an interface to that printer. Uh, so we did kind of go out and seek some uh, advice from some other printer companies that are out there. Uh, those of you that are working with uh, some of the customers and third parties that are using those blaster printers, um, there was a company that did buy out some of that inventory and kind of start up again. 
uh, but we also got together with a company called TSC. That's Tom uh, TTSC Printers, and they um, they have a couple different models that they can actually uh, emulate the Cognitive Blaster protocol, the CPL protocol, and basically have a drop-in replacement for the the blaster printer. So. You know, uh, if you are looking for, uh, you know, information on that company or a way to get those printers, again, we don't sell them directly, uh, but there is kind of a drop in replacement for that four inch thermal format printer uh, that is available on the market from TSC printers. Um, they're available through most common uh, printer sources, but the key there is you need to make sure that whoever you're buying that printer from, that they supply you with the software that emulates the blaster printer. Um, and again, if you run into any issues with that, you can contact me directly. This is Jeff Hageman, uh, and and you know via email, and I can get you hooked up with this fire. Thanks. Sorry about that, Pete. No problem. Hey, hey Jeff, I'll just add. Um, their website is tscprinters.com. Tscprinters.com. Yeah, and they're they're not going to sell directly. They sell through they sell through distribution, much like much like Liquid Controls does. Uh, but uh, again, the important part there is make sure that when you order those, that you're specifying that it's you need the CPL or Cognitive Blaster printer uh, language option. Thank you, guys. Okay, uh, uh, just continue with the system calibration. Uh, the thing I talked about that if you see the uh, there's an issue with your temperature probe and it, it is failing during the calibration or any inspection. Uh, talk about how to set the offset. Um, I'm not going to spend time on it. It's not something very common. People do it, but in case if you need to know if you do want to change it, like I said, you can do only half a degree. Uh, uh, you know, not more than that. If you're going to go over half a degree, it's going to say range, range error. It's not going to let you do that. Uh, so you won't be able to change the offset. So, so if you think you're really necessary, you have to do uh, just the half a degree, you can otherwise replace the probe. That's the best thing. OK, uh, the next, uh, the very important, which is a product calibration. Uh, and this is where you set up all your product. You set up your product name and product type. It's very simple stuff. Um, if you uh, if you take a look on the uh, the third one is a composition type, which is in this slide here it says none. If you have LPG, of course, you can pick table 24. If you have, uh, you know, either fuel or some other uh, product which you you are using the uh, temperature compensator, you have to use one of those table uh, to pick which table is uh, applicable for your area. Uh, the most, uh, the fourth slide, the most common in whole, uh, you know, the set up the configuration is the pulses. If you don't have pulses, <clears throat> you won't be able to start the delivery. Simple as that. You can ignore every single field in the whole unit. And just put the pulses in it, you'll be able to start the delivery. So this is the most uh, important. And also, if you are setting up the field, uh, do two things here. If you are using the easy command, make sure save the configurations. If you're not using easy command using the lab pad, make sure print a calibration ticket. Basically, it's just going from stop to ship print back to stop within two seconds. If you are already in calibration position, just flip the switch to stop position. While you have a long ticket in the printer, it will print the calibration ticket. Once you have this calibration ticket, save that in your file. For God's sake, something goes wrong with the unit. And if you are replacing a board, all you have to do is just take the information from the calibration ticket and enter to the new uh, board. That's it. If you don't have uh, the information, if you don't have the information available, guess what? You're going to have to get the prover and calibrate the whole system. So that's the only choice you have. I have seen where people take the calibration ticket, put it in a Ziploc bag, and leave it inside the unit. I've seen it. And the last slide over here, I uh, uh, just want to show you the preset. If you are doing a preset through the lab pad, you can use this field as a preset, enter the amount and start the delivery. And obviously, if you put 50 uh, gallons preset on the right side remaining, it's going to say 50 and it's going to count down. So this is in case you're using the uh, you know, lab pad to do preset. 
this is just the, the composition uh, type. Uh, all these tables up here. Uh, the most common, obviously, for the LPG people, uh, you know, use uh, uh, table 24, and also for the Europe and Canada, and then some other. Uh, if you notice for the lube oil, and they also have the refined uh, petroleum product for USA. So again, uh, there, this is not common here, but especially, but if the other part of the world, this maybe is common for some other countries. But the most common, which everybody uh, kind of mandatory over here in state in Canada, they have to use the uh, these tables here. Unless you're in Canada, you can use uh, table 54. If it's US, use table 24. OK, now there will be a class on June 24th uh, for the calibration. I just put one slide up there how to do the calibration. Uh, just very simple steps. Uh, I'm not going to go over this because there will be a class uh, with details how to do the calibration. With LCR2, just give you a quick two uh, cent. Yes, you can do the calibration with or without the lab pad. Uh, lab pad is not necessary to do the calibration. You can just use select and increase key. Uh, just do the calibration. Also, step by step, uh, these steps are available in the manual. But this is uh, it's, uh, basically flip the switch to six o'clock, uh, uh, access to the product calibration, and start the delivery. And whatever the poor quantity is, enter the proper poor quantity at the end of the delivery. Uh, it's very simple steps. Hi, I think Jeff. Sorry. Hey, uh, just to clarify. You did say June 24th. However, the date is June 23rd. Uh, it says on your slide there. So June. Is 24th. it 24th? Okay. 23rd. 23rd. Yes. Thanks. OK, this is just a product calibration continue as a uh, more information on it. Um, but I want to talk about I want to talk about just few things there as one close. If you're doing a preset and you have a two stage valve, make sure we have the develop value uh, as one close value sitting up there right under the S1 close. Uh, this is another common call. Somebody says he's doing a preset, but it's not stopping accurately. So if they're doing a 100 gallon preset, are they stopping 101, 102? Or stopping at 99. The first thing we say, what is your S1 close? And you'll be surprised 50% time people say, what is that? Okay, go to your lab pad, go to product elevation, hit the M pound key until you get to the S1 close. So you're going to have to have, uh, let's say, uh, you know, depends the size of the meter uh, five gallons, uh, three gallons, seven gallons. Again, you have to set it up something. So if you're running a, a 100 gallon delivery and it's a two stage preset, if we set the S1 to five gallons at 95, it's going to shut down your S1, open up the uh, S2 valve for the slow flow so you can stop accurately at 100 gallons. Uh, the next third slide, I want to talk about the multi point calibration. Uh, I'm sure uh, this is also going to be part of the calibration. Uh, this is not as common as a single point calibration, but again, if there is a repeatability uh, and it's an old meter, Yes, you can use a uh, multi point calibration to uh, straighten up the curve. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend time as uh, if you really want to learn multi point calibration, you can uh, go to the uh, you know product manuals and we have details on it how to use this uh, multi point calibration. Like I said, it's not something common people use it, but yes, we do have people uh, some required uh, by their local government to use multi point calibration. Uh, this is just the product and shift information. This is something if somebody manually want to see the uh, shift report, how many deliveries and all that stuff, uh, you know, what's the gross total is. Uh, I don't see too many people use, uh, you know, lab pad to access the product and shift. What they usually do, they print the shift report. Basically, you just put a ticket in it and go to, uh, you know, shift print, and that's it. A lot of people, what they do, that at the morning before they start the work, they will print a shift report, which is we call the shift start ticket. And then they, they will make uh, deliveries all day long. And at the end of the day, they're going to print another ticket we'll call the shift end ticket. You can also clear the shift ticket using the lab pad, but you can also use the, the red knob switch. Uh, this is again another delivery and preset information. This is all the basic inf uh, information. Um, uh, also, you can set up your price and tax 
in case if you are using uh, the pricing or tax or percentage tax, uh, there's a lot of information. They are same information from the previous screens. And I want to talk about the, the last uh, screen here, uh, ARX output one, ARX two. Again, uh, if you are uh, sending a signal to control something or send a signal to uh, you know, ramp up the RPM on a truck, you can use one of those auxiliary outputs um, in case if you have to. It's not something common, yes, but there's an option available. You can set it up and you can always contact us if you need any help with that. Also, uh, the, the service manual talk about these AUX1 and AUX2. Again, uh, the very common one on if you notice here is on during delivery. That time uh, you'll get a signal anytime you start, uh, you are in active delivery. In that case, even your red knob is in the opposite after you ran the product. Is still going to be active. Uh, it's going to have a signal available for you for the AUX1 or AUX2. It's up to you. Uh, this is just a diagnostic screen. Uh, the most common which we always go through is, OK, uh, something happened to the unit. Can you go to the diagnostic message? Uh, if you see right now, it says preset stop. You'd be surprised somebody says, I cannot start the delivery. Can you go to diagnostic? Over here, there's a message will be delivery ticket pending. If you got a delivery ticket pending, you must print a ticket using the red knob, not the lap pad. Do not use the lap pad. Just use the red knob, print the ticket to clear the pending ticket. Also, the uh, very important information, you got the software information on it. Uh, obviously, uh, the most common call is that I got five trucks, but this one truck is not printing the way other four trucks printing. The first thing we'll do, okay, let's go to diagnostic or print a calibration ticket. What is your ST number? I got ST 200. Can you print another ticket from the another truck? Yes, this one says two or two. Well, that's the answer. So you cannot just flash the, uh, just the ticket. You have to flash all three software. As, uh, you know, this is a demo software, just say SD, otherwise it would, would be an SR 260, SL 200, or ST, whichever you need to flash. Again, we had a class on easy command program. Uh, you can always go back to the FTP site, and I believe Dan uh, uh, probably have some uh, these training presentations somewhere on uh, on uh, online too. Right, Dan? Hi, uh, hey, I think it's Jeff. I'll step in there. Yeah, I mean, with with the course when they sign up for the course, uh, they also got an invitation to uh portal for the videos so if if you're not familiar with how to do that please let us know but uh you should already have uh have received an invite to be able to access uh the videos that are online so each one of these classes are being recorded uh again for for your benefit uh and for ours so people can go back and, and view them later uh but uh you just log on uh once you have that uh, log on that you got with your invitation uh, you go to the liquid controls website to the download videos section from the LC University and you'll be able to download those videos. But again, if you're having an issue with that, just let us know and we can walk you through it. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, this is uh, just a layout of the different ticket uh, what we have available. I put the uh, red arrow on it. These are the most common uh, tickets we have. Uh, just remember the software for the 81920 is going to be different. Uh, it says SR210 versus the blue board. Uh, they are SR260. Uh, the flashing is a bit different. You have to use the easy command uh, to get to know a little more about if you want to flash 81920 board. We have these files uh, available under the FTP site. Uh, these are the, uh, the language files, and these are the ticket files. And if you notice, I did put uh, some uh, red arrows on it, so these are the most common files. Uh, the PowerPoint is going to be available for you guys to just take a look, uh, you know, in the after the training class. Um, just want to talk about a little bit security. Uh, you know, the most common somebody wants to get into the factory, they want to do clear all, like reset the whole unit. Uh, they can do that. It will reset every single field from on this unit. Sometimes they have some glitches, some problem with the unit, and we recommend to do the clear all. And if it's a blue board. You are going to get the message SR260. A lot of people get confused and they just call us. Uh, what is this message? Is basically it's a software 
the reason why this message is in case if this is an aviation unit, you can use the increase key to change from 260 to 264 because 264 is for the aviation. Other than that, this is uh, just one little slide uh, talked about how to do, uh, do the clear up, which is resetting the whole unit. Also, the easy command uh, PowerPoint also have the same thing. Very simple step. I just want to show you guys uh, this slide is available for you guys. And if you notice uh, on this lap pad, there, there will be a message uh, on the lap pad to use the push button. Now, if you are using the green board, which is uh, 81920, you're not going to see this message. Because once you do clear out, that's it, it's done. Because in, S, uh, in ST, you know, it's SR210, uh, we manually program SR214 for the aviation. So there is no option for the SR260 or SR210. So you, over here with the blue board, you have to manually uh, select that. I'll just give you an example. If you are, have a like aviation system, it's SR264, and we are doing a reset uh, factory, you know, like a clear all, it will default back to 260. And a lot of people, what they do, they press select and then they say, we are printing a ticket, but it's printing differently. The layout is differently and the unit act differently. First thing we go to diagnostic. Okay, what's the tick? What's the software it says SR260? Well, that's the problem. Now, the only way to go back to SR264, we have to do the clear all again and use the increase key to change from SR260 to SR264. Uh, this is just a security. Uh, uh, this is very common. Uh, some people say they want to change, let's say, date and time or something. Again, your security must be uh, unlocked. It's very simple. Uh, we do not uh, put any or store any code inside the unit. A lot of people call us, can you give us a code? There's no code. Basically, all, it's a matter of uh, pressing the enter, bring the cursor down, like in the third slice, and press the uh, you know, enter again automatically, it will unlock the system and then you can manually unlock it. It's very simple. We do not uh, put any information in, but one thing to remember, we have, uh, uh, you know, received some calls. Somebody entered the, uh, the key in it, but the person left the company. Now nobody knows the code. There's only one way to get the code is to get to the factory key. Under the factory key, you can access the, the user key. If you notice, uh, you know, you got a fourth slide, it says unlocked. But if you go to the fifth slide, actually, I went into the factory uh, setup, which I showed you in the next slide, where this is the hidden key. This is where somebody must have stored it. So this is like at the back door. Now, this is slide, very, very important slide, and you'll be surprised uh, uh, probably. 50% time we get a call, uh, you know, uh, how to get to the factory key if there's a pending ticket. Basically, you have a unit, there's a pending ticket, but you do not have the printer and you cannot print the ticket. So this is a little step, a uh, uh, few steps to use how to get to the factory key and you have to use uh, the programmer calculator, uh, uh, which every computer has the programmer calculator and we just use the code from hex to decimal. These are the steps. I don't think we have these steps anywhere in our any books or any presentation. So this is the first time. Uh, actually, I'm putting this officially <laughs> so you don't have to call us. So this is how you can get to the factory and how you can do the calculation. It's a very simple steps. Anybody can do it. So this is with the pending ticket. Now, if you, uh, if you don't want to do clear out, you want to just do to clear the pending ticket, all you have to do is get into the factory settings and get out. That's it. Look at the very bottom. Clear the pending ticket only. Exit the factory menu and press M1 key. That's it. So you get into the factory menu by using this method and just hit the M1 key. If there's a pending ticket, it will be clear because if you got a pending ticket, I don't care if you have the, the red knob on six o'clock position, you are not allowed to, you will be, won't be able to change anything basically. So that's very, very important. These are the selected switch uh, menu. Uh, if you are, go ahead. Hey, I'm sorry. Let me just, can you back up one slide to the factory mode? 
I just want to make sure something's clear. And there, there's a reason for the past 25 years that we don't publish how to get into the factory mode, because this is really, uh, it was originally meant to be a factory only access piece. But we know, and those of you that are familiar with LCR2 already, that, that there's sometimes a, a need for service technicians to get in and do this process. And sometimes to call the factory, that, that can be inconvenient, especially those guys that are fairly seasoned and, and, and understand this process. Uh, you know, it's easier for them to know how to do that process. So that's why we don't publish it, uh, you know, in, in our manuals directly. Uh, but again, it is an important process. Those of you that do do regular support work on this will probably want to understand that process. Feel free to contact our team directly and we can help walk you through it the first time if you're not familiar with it. But again, this is something that someone that, you know, is an experienced service technician that's working on our products would do. This is not for your you know, normal, uh, you know, everyday user. So I just want to make sure that was clear. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, uh, this is just LCA2 selectors uh, switch plate menu. If you notice on the on the switch plate, we have all these menu, which all is a matter of hitting the select key. It depends what position is the red knob. Uh, you can, uh, you know, you can see even totalizer information. You can see the product. You can switch the product. Um, you know. You can even unlock the security. Uh, very common is somebody says, I'm trying to switch my product one to product two because the security is locked. That's why. So again, it's, it's very handy uh, uh, information. Uh, you know, sudden, let's say if you're in the print position, uh, all these options there. Um, it's a matter of you need to play around with it, but if you take a look on the, on the right side here, uh, you know, if somebody says, I want to see the totalizer, OK, there's a you know high number and the low number. Uh, basically, if this one says H98745, and this one, the next, if you hit the select key, it says L5432.0. What that means is starting from 98, going forward to the right, and you add this uh, digit to the totalizer. That's your grand totalizer. So if you take that number to your uh, using a lab pad, it will match. So this is only in case you, you don't have a lap pad. Um, again, um, this is a, just a calibration uh, position where obviously if somebody wants to uh, do the calibration or make any changes to it, so you have, they will flip the switch and use select key or increase key, uh, you know, to do the prove the unit, they can do that. Uh, this is just a preset delivery with a lab pad, uh, which I did talk about. It's just a matter of just entering the information in. This is just a delivery ticket. I just want to go fast forward so I can get to the unit and show you guys uh, this information. It's very simple steps uh, put up there. Just enter the value a matter of just hit the start key. You will get the message saying counter test in progress and you can start the delivery and that will and you can also print the ticket. So this is your ticket uh, 50 gallons. And I did have some pricing on it, and that's your total amount on it. Uh, this is uh, without the lap pad. If you are using, uh, if you don't have a lap pad, and you just want to make a preset delivery, uh, basically it's a matter of leaving the switch on stop position, hit the select key, choose your product, and go to the next level and enter your uh, the value for the preset, and flip the switch to run position, and that's it. It's a very very simple step. Uh, this is your shift uh, start ticket. If you notice on the right side and the shift end on the left side. So shift end usually is a small ticket. And also at, if you take a look at the bottom of the ticket, uh, delivery says four. If somebody called us, you know, and they have uh, some conf confusing about total totalizer or deliveries, we always talk about, okay, what is, do you have your shift end ticket? Yes, it says we have four delivery tickets. How many tickets you have in your hand? I have two. What happened to the other two tickets? That means we have missing two tickets. So we need to find those two tickets. It's very easy. If somebody ever have any issue where, uh, you know, after a week or two weeks, uh, they have the issue is in their conning, the gallons uh, are different versus the shift reports, which what we usually do, we work with the, uh, these people, we tell them, look, let's do a shift start, a shift end for the next, you know, the whole week. And then we, all we do is just match the number every day. Uh, this is just a diagnostic ticket. 
which is very common ticket, which I recommend uh, mentioned earlier, that if you're done with the programming, make sure print the ticket and save it. So this way you have your uh, pulses information, uh, you know, part of, for the product one or either two or three or four. You have all the information and yeah, you also have the software information in. Uh, this is a uh, quick in case if you don't have a lab pad, you can use easy command. Again, you can follow the easy command setup and programming. It's a matter of uh, setting up your easy command, connecting to the LCI2. And for the each field, all you have to do once you change with the one page, all you have to do is just hit apply to LCR and that's it. Nothing else. So I can switch from general setup to system setup to calibration setup. And all I have to do is make changes, hit apply to LCR and be done with it. That's it. This is only for the easy command. Obviously, after you finish with your setting up your fields, you can always save the configuration. So we'll take some questions too, but uh, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to turn my camera on for the for the live unit. Let's see here. Uh, Jeff, can you see anything? Atik, I can see your screen. You need to hit uh, the dismiss button there at the top for one thing. But okay. Okay. You need to, uh, you need to stop sharing control. Okay, got it. All right, and I've pinned. You need to turn on your camera because I've pinned you to the screen now. Okay. Okay, better. Yeah, you're going to need to back out a little bit. Okay. So on, uh, my, on my view, I can't, I can only see part of full. Okay. And I'm trying to enlarge it. Exit uh, spotlight. No, it, it may be the view I have here. I, okay. And then can you see it, the unit? Yeah, I can see. I can see all the keys and I can only see partial. Uh, yeah, partial. Screen. It will be partial. It will be partial. Um, OK. OK. So, so right now, uh, if you notice, I'm on a delivery and preset screen and and you can see LCI2 has a two screws on the plate right now. So if I'm doing any programming, First thing I need to do, I need to remove these uh, screws so I can remove the plate and flip this switch to six o'clock position. Hey, Atik, if you wouldn't mind just backing the camera out a little bit to, so we can see if it's possible, so you can see. There you go. Yeah, it's a little better. Better? Yeah, we're just we're just cutting off the, the left side of the LCR2 as well. No, I don't. I, that's that's the whole tension is not to worry about the left side of the LCR2 oh, because okay. I want to focus on the keypad. Perfect. Yeah, I just want to show the red knob and the keypad. Nothing to do with the left side of the LCI2. So basically, uh, we have a delivery and preset. Uh, if you notice, I can just use use the arrow right or left key and scroll through all these options. Okay. What I want to do, I want to get to the uh, uh, basic uh, just example. I'm going to go to the general setup, uh, the one in the slide. It's a matter of just pressing enter. And you have the date and time, uh, you know, all these things. I can just hit the, you know, if you notice my D is flashing, I can just press enter and my cursor is right below the zero now. So today is a June 06-09-21 and just press enter. That's it. That's how you're going to use a lab pad. A even for any other field. And hold that pad. This is how you're going to be. Bring the cursor, hey, press enter. Hey, I have a quick yes. question. So I see that that cursor is flashing on the D and date. Is is that my indication that I can make an edit to that field? Yes. All right. What is what does it look like when I'm not in calibration mode? Well, right now my security is locked, uh, unlocked. So that's why it is flashing it because I can change it. If my security is locked, yeah. I won't be able to change any. If, if I'm on a field like say say you move to a different field like date format or something that I can't change, what does it look like? Well, uh, so right now since the security is uh, unlocked, I can change it. 
So let's let's go back to my security and we can uh, change it to. Or you can go to a field like. Like oh, any other field. Yeah, so let's go to like this field here. Yeah, OK. So right now I'm in the pulses. So if you notice here, that red knob is in stop position. And the pulses, nothing is flashing. I can do anything. There's no way I can change anything. There's no way I can change anything and nobody won't be able to change anything because that's how it's designed for. So that means if you are especially in the product calibration, you must remove the plate. For the to remove to, uh, to be able to remove the plate, you're going to have to break the seal from the side door. You have to break the seal from the switch plate. That's the only way. If I flip the switch here, now I'm on a six o'clock position and bring the cursor. Take a look here. Now my P is flashing. Now I can press enter and I can enter my K factors. Just because my switch is in six o'clock position. That's the only way. Because this is the most critical uh, feature in the unit because they don't want anybody else to change it. So and there's, at, at this position, doesn't matter your security is even unlocked. You won't be able to change anything on especially under the product calibration. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to see if that was clear. Thank you. Yeah. So this is just a general setup. Uh, I just want to go quickly. I can just hit the M pound key. I can scroll through. Uh, just say unit ID. Uh, unit ID is basically the truck number. Uh, depends what ticket format you have. Sometimes people say we want to print the unit ID or truck number on the, it's called the unit ID on the ticket. Yes, you can enter the unit ID. Uh, this is just a no flow timer. I can just change this to zero if I want to. Now it depends what ticket format I have. I'm probably going to have multiple delivery at one site message because I set the no flow timer to zero. So basically, I can scroll through more uh, preset type. I can change that to you know whichever I want to net both or gross. Um, and same thing with the preset clear or uh, you know required or inventory or retain. I can do that. Hey, Tik, I have another question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes you use the arrow keys and sometimes you hit the M with the little number sign next to it. What's the difference there? And well, the M pound will actually take you to the whole next section of the same feature. The M1 key is going to take you out of that uh, particular uh, menu. So if I had the, had the just say I'm on a general setup example, I'm going to hit enter. I can use arrow right key and scroll through each field and go to the next section, but I can also hit the M pound key, so I don't have to, you know, uh, press M, uh, you know, the arrow right key multiple times. I can just change the next slide. So, see that? I can change the whole menu, but if I want to get out from it, I just have to hit the M1 key. Great, thank you. Okay, so I go to the system setup. Basically, I'm going to press enter. I can uh, just say you have a meter ID, which is meter ID mean uh, the serial number from the meter. Ticket, yes or no, I can change that to skip or no. We'll leave it as no right now. So these are the printer types. Again, you have the old font A, new font A, new font B, especially new font B, especially for the uh, roll printers. Um, so, or I can hit the M pound key, it's going to take me to the uh, you know, the next uh, selections, next selections, uh, temperature, flow directions, if you notice. But if I want to go step by step for each field, I can just use arrow right key and just keep scrolling. Hey, I have another question. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you, but I do have a question here mm -hmm. about the ticket. When it says no, does that mean it will it, it won't print a ticket ever? If as long as the printer is connected, it will print the ticket. But if the tick, if the if the printer is not connected and this set for no, you can still reset the system because it's not really mandatory looking for the printer. Oh, because so it's like a mandatory thing. So if that's yeah, that's mandatory thing. So right now, if I set this to yes, okay. Now I disconnect my printer. I won't be able to reset my system because I set the ticket to yes. So I must add this. At this point right now, I must 
connect my printer, put a ticket in the printer to be able to initiate a delivery. Simple as that. But if I set it up to no, I can disconnect the printer, I can leave the printer connected. So if the printer is connected and the ticket is in it, it will print the ticket. So right. another, uh, go ahead. I just said thank you for answering my question. Thank you. No problem. So we have, uh, again, uh, Unor Mayor, I can use gallons, uh, others, barrels, kilogram, pounds, cubic. So it's up to you guys what you guys want to uh, choose. I want to quickly go through a few more. Um, just go to the product calibration. Now, these are the, the product code and the name. Uh, these name uh, you can have to enter manually. You know, if you don't want to print anything, you can hit clear and press enter again. So I just took that. Uh, this is the product type. Uh, it's a predefined. You have to just select, uh, you know, whichever is. If it's aviation unit, I can uh, just select aviation. And if I want to put, uh, you know, it's a, it's a jet A, uh, you know, simply what I can do, I can just type in, you know, alpha down because it's a J, and then I need to put E, alpha up, E, jet, and T, which is alpha down. T, jet, so I can, um, uh, you know, do that and uh, use the arrow right key to put a space in it, and I can just put A in it, jet A. So this is my new name. So it depends on what you want to type in, just hit alpha up, alpha down, uh, which is cross pendant to the, uh, the letters. Uh, the next one is composition type. Uh, right now it says none, but I could always select whichever I want to use it. You know, for the LPG, I, you know, table 24, the most common here in state. If, uh, you know, I don't want to get into more, but if there's no table available, uh, you know, you can use a, a linear F, uh, one of those tables, which, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you can call us, we can talk about it, which is kind of open field uh, for anybody to use it. Uh, these are, uh, you know, the pulses, again, uh, the most common uh, in case, uh, you know, you lose your information. If you have the information, you can enter manually or you can have to do the calibration. Uh, anytime you're doing the calibration, uh, make sure the switch in six o'clock. This is where you're going to start the delivery, run the prover. If this just prover says 100 gallons, and but the actually prover says 105, you can enter 105 or vice versa, whatever you need to make changes. But that's how you do the calibration, which uh, we are going to have the next class, which is going to cover pretty much uh, this information. Uh, this is just a gross quantity, gross information. Uh, this is S1, we talked about it. But right now, just say I don't have any information on it. So I can just hit enter five as my S1 close, where it's going to shut down my S1 uh, remainder of the five gallons. Uh, this is us multiply. This is for these, uh, you know, in case, in case if they need a second unit or mayor. Uh, so they are just say using gallons, but they also need a kilogram. They can do that. Uh, it's up to them. Like, Sometimes aviation, uh, you know, uh, units, they will have a second, uh, secondary multiply. Uh, this is a PT, which is uh, the uh, multi point calibration. Uh, again, uh, there will be next class on this one, multi-point calibration. Uh, not too many people use it. A uh, little complicated, but again, you have to really follow the steps uh, to perform this. Uh, especially, it's only for the older, older units. Uh, this is just a diagnostic. Uh, you know, we talked about, like right now, in my case here, it's the end of list. If I press enter and use the arrow key, it's not going through any other settings any other information, so that means it is end of list. I don't have any information. If there is a pending ticket, uh, I could have a pending ticket in it. Um, I can even uh, produce one, I'll show you in a bit. But if I hit the impound key, go to the next slide here. This is the most common, obviously. You see the software information. So in my case, it's ST because of the demo software. And the ticket, I have ST203. And again, gross count of pulsar fault if there's any pulsar failure. 
uh, want to go to the security. Uh, those slides uh, you cite uh, how to get to get to the security. So right now the security says unlocked. I can go to security and lock it manually. So this is a very common call. Somebody says my security is locked. How do I unlock it? And they do have a lap pad. Simple. Go to user key. Press enter. Do not enter anything and press enter again. Uh, actually. Hold on. So right now, if you notice, I'm trying to press enter, but it's not letting my security locked. Anybody can tell me why I cannot unlock it right now. Anybody? Anybody? Because there is a security uh, key programmed in it. That's why. There's a security code. Remember in the slide, uh, there was one slide. Uh, there was some number. Uh, I believe it's a nine, eight, uh, seven. I'm not, I'm not even sure what number was. I'm going to give a shot. Nine, eight, seven, six. Let's try that. OK, I guess I guessed it. So that is my code. So just say if I don't have this code, I forgot about it. So the only way to get into security is you have to get into the you have to use the calculator. And uh, you know, and uh, do the hex to decimal. Very quick other ways. Um, so right now I can hit enter and hit clear this one out. So right now I don't have any security. I can go back here and lock it. Come back here. So right now I can go to user key, press enter and press enter again. If you notice it's unlocked now because there was no key because I already cleared it. You have to refer to the go over the slide. Uh, on the PowerPoint, take a look how this uh, you know function works. Uh, the matter of uh, starting the delivery, if the lab pad is connected, basically you can just go to run. It will not reset until you start the delivery uh, from the lab pad. So it's so counter. Any time the lap pad's connected, you're required to start the delivery from the lap pad, not from the red switch? Yes, from the lap pad. It will not reset it. But if, if the lap pad's not connected, then you can use the red switch for. Then you can switch, right. Yeah, obviously it's uh, just, uh, you know, red switch to start the delivery. So right now I'm, st I'm starting the delivery from the lap pad. Uh, you know, I can hit stop. I can go back to start again. Or I can directly hit the print button. It will end the delivery. Now, if I don't want to use the lab pad, uh, basically I'm going to have to disconnect my lab pad. Uh, give me one second to just to show you. Uh, I'm not sure what time it is. Let's see. Okay. So, when you disconnect that lab pad, is there any sort of timer or anything you have? Anything you have to do to? Well, just remember, if you are in the middle of the delivery and you're trying to disconnect this, uh, you may have uh, some error messages on the lab pad or something else could have depends the situation of your status on the screen. Because I know in my case, everything was uh, delivery was ended. I didn't do anything. Now, all I have to do just move the red knob to stop since I officially ended the delivery by using the print key. I can just go back to run and reset my LCR2 without any problem. So right now I can go to stop and go to print. But uh, there's a lot of people they can confuse because they start the delivery with the lab pad and then they disconnect things up during the delivery, then they connect back up. So really, if you're really using a lab pad, stick with the lab pad. If you want to done with the lab pad, make sure you finish your delivery and then just use the red knob to move on to the, uh, you know, resetting the system. And uh, the most common uh, thing which we get a call, somebody says, um, I just connect my lab pad, but I do not have a display. Very common. The reason why they didn't have display because the unit was already powered up. And this unit is already powered up, you must hit any key to get the display because sometimes you're not going to see it. Uh, but in, I just hooked up my lap pad. Uh, so right now I'm back on the lap pad. Now what I want 
what I really want to do, I want to uh, show you guys how the pending ticker look like. I'm going to. I'm going to set my quickly system calibration. And ticket to. Yes. OK, I'm going to. Move the right now to run position. So right now it says check printer and cable. So right now I don't have any printer set up, but I have a. Let's see here. I just activate my printer. And start the delivery. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to shut down my printer basically. My printer is not available. And I'm going to hit print. And I'm going to go to the. Uh, diagnostic and press enter. Take a look here. What is this the message? Delivery end request, but if I go back to the press enter, scroll down up. This is the important message delivery ticket pending. Why the delivery ticket is pending? Because I start the delivery with the printer. But I turn my printer off and end the delivery. Now, since there's a pending ticket, I won't be able to start my uh, delivery. For next delivery, I won't be able to. So if I get out from there. And just say I go to start. Can you read it? It's a previous delivery ticket pending. So now the only way to get rid of this, the proper way is. Get your printer ready. Make sure you have your printer available. Uh, I'm going to activate my printer. And now. I must use that end up, go to stop and go to print. I'm going to print the ticket. So that's my ticket. I'm going to go back to run. And I'm going to start the delivery. Counter test in progress is going to start the delivery. That's the proper way to do it. Stop print. Any question? Hey, Atik. Yes, it's Jack. I, I was curious. Could you show how those alpha buttons work? Because I know those can be a little confusing. Maybe okay. do a quick ticket header or something. Yeah, so we just uh, go to the. Uh, general setup. Maybe, maybe uh, if you want to actually calibration, maybe you want to put a product name in there. Maybe you want to. Okay. Put, okay. Uh, you know, like a, so this is, uh, I believe, a. Uh, uh, okay. Product information. There you go. Product name. Okay. So basically, uh, again, I just cleared it. <laughs> cleared whatever I had. <laughs> Basically, you have the, you know, uh, A and B, and then middle you have one, two, three, and then you have alpha uh, up, then you have alpha down. So basically, if I have to use uh, just a letter, uh, just give you example again, J. Well, J is on the alpha uh, lower right side. So I'm going to hit alpha one time and hit the number four key. So okay. are those buttons in the corners or in the middle? <laughs> Well, th these are the corner alpha. Right. Alpha is the corner. Beef. Now, if I didn't use alpha, if I don't use alpha and just press the numbers, guess what? I'm just config number only. Right. But if I have to, if I have to use the the ladder, I make sure hit alpha up. I use this. Alpha down. I use this. Alpha up. I use this, so that's how it's supposed to be. Got it. So this is clear. Let me show you again. So since we on aviation, I'm going to hit alpha uh, down, which is J, and then I have to use the E, which is alpha up. I have to use it E and then T. And then if you want to use space, just use arrow right key. It's going to skip to the one section and you just hit uh, uh, letter A, which is alpha up and press enter. That's it. 
Hey, just a little practice. You're gonna have to do it a uh, few time and uh, it's pretty simple. Any question, Jeff? Uh, I guess uh, uh, Bill need to get on it. Uh, I'm taking his time right now. Um, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead All right, thanks sort of for taking questions after Bill's section here. Okay, Bill, you go ahead. All right, so in this section, we're going to actually go through some of the troubleshooting. Um, so we're going to kind of go over a little bit about printing calibration tickets, how to do that. Uh, we're going to look at some things in the diagnostics. Uh, we're going to look at some system issues, power issues, lap pad issues. Uh, Atik went through a few of those already, so those we'll just kind of brush over. Uh, some of the printer issues, uh, valve pulser display, and, and some of the common error messages that we may see on either a, a calibration ticket. Oh, what happened here? There we go. Um, and then some of the common errors. So th the first thing that I wanted to show, and this is a document uh, for the clear all. Um, I would probably say 75% of the issues that we see uh, typically can, can be solved by just a, uh, performing a simple clear all. This is a one page PDF document that is on our FTP site that you can go ahead and download. You can print off, you can carry it around with you. That way, if you do get into an issue where you a clear all is, is something to do, uh, then you can actually follow this instruction sheet. It'll walk you step by step through it. It gives you the important fields to fill out. So that way, when you do the clear all, you can actually go ahead and enter that information in again. So uh, again, this is available on the FTP site. It's good to have available if you are out working uh, with some of these units in the field. So, so one of the biggest things is, is ask questions. OK, when you're troubleshooting, we really need to get the information uh, as to what's going on. Um, a lot of times if we get third party information, uh, you know, it may not be exactly what's going on. And if and if the issue isn't really explained exactly what's going on, we may go down a, a different path as far as what we need to do with it. So firsthand information is always the best uh, when it comes to troubleshooting itself. Um, so whenever possible, always speak directly to somebody that's experiencing the failure. Um, the other thing is to, to make sure that you guys are using a digital voltmeter. Um, I touched a little bit about this earlier on, on the first part of the presentation about the difference between test lights and a voltmeter. So voltmeters are going to tell you what the voltage is, you know, whether it be uh, under 9 volts or at 12 volts, uh, where a test light's just going to tell you you've got voltage there. So you, you just want to make sure that you're using a good digital voltmeter. Um, and again, uh, I, I can't stress this enough. Never move those jumpers or terminal blocks while voltage is on to the LCR. Um, it, it causes all kinds of problems. Um, and unfortunately, those problems are, are, are created by moving those. So um, and then if you do have any kind of uh, burnt traces or moisture on the uh, on the board, uh, make sure that you find out what caused that before replacing the boards. Um, I have had people that have called in and, and burned up a board. They replace the board, and as soon as they power the board up, it happens again. Uh, and and as, as you all know, the boards are not, they're not cheap. So you, you definitely want to find out what happened before we, um, you know, we install new stuff. Um, and then also print diagnostic tickets, and, and we'll go through that a little bit more uh, if we can. Sometimes you can't. It just doesn't allow you to. Uh, the two most important diagnostic tools that we have are a lap pad or easy command. Uh, if you can use those, that's great. Or uh, printing off a diagnostic ticket. Uh, if you can't do either one of those, then then a lot of times it's it's very difficult to figure out what's wrong with the board. But those are the the two most important uh, troubleshooting uh, for, as far as getting information is is the diagnostic ticket and a lap pad. So in order to print a diagnostic ticket, uh, what you do need to do is, is put a ticket in the printer. And then take your red knob from the stop position, turn it down to shift print and then right back in the stop. And you have to do that within two seconds. If you go through that procedure and you do print off a shift report, 
uh, that's telling you that you left it in shift print just a little bit too long, so you'll have to do it a little bit quicker. Now, when you do print off a diagnostic ticket, it's going to give you all the information, but on the bottom, underneath this last net, it is typically going to have some sort of a message. Now, in the newer registers, uh, you may see a code with a date code. Uh, you know, so it's going to give you a time, uh, it's going to give you a date stamp on it, and then it's going to give you some sort of a code. Okay, those codes are actually uh, in a document on our FTP site. But what that's telling us is that is a, a, a an issue uh, or a message that happened in the past. Okay, that happened at that specific date and time. Um, so if if you get a diagnostic ticket that has a previous date and time, you know, of of months ago. Uh, you know, you may not have to worry about that. It may just have been a one-time thing when they were installing the board. Uh, but what you're really looking for in a diagnostic ticket is if it has an actual text message that says pulser failure, meter calibration error, temperature error, VCF domain error. If it says something like that where it's actually giving you an actual text failure, those are the ones that had just happened in real time. So those are the ones that we want to pay attention to. And also in the diagnostic messages, um, you've got these these different messages. There's only three of them that that are stored. OK, so they don't stick around for longer than than three. And the diagnostic messages only record the events. So if, if a driver has a failure and the driver goes and he tries to restart a delivery and print off a delivery ticket, he may inadvertently kick out any kind of diagnostic message that may have been there. So anytime you have somewhat of a failure, you have to look at that diagnostic message immediately before doing anything else or print off a ticket. Uh, because once that diagnostic message has been uh, pushed out of the queue, it, you can't get it back until, until it sees that failure again. So some of the common messages that you may see, uh, a, a CRC failure, um, again, it, this is a clear, oh, this is a memory issue. Uh, a flash not initialized uh, is typically when somebody is trying to do a clear all and the red knob is not in calibration. So when you do a clear all, you have to make sure that your red knob is straight up and down in that six o'clock position. Uh, if it's not, you will get this flash not initialized when doing a clear all. Uh, range error is just telling you that whatever information you put into that specific field, uh, is not accurate for for what it expects. So if it's something that you would put a, a numerical value in, such as an S1 closure, and you inadvertently hit the alpha key and then put an A in there, uh, it would give you a range error because it's not a, a numeric character. The, the start enabled uh, switch to run to begin the delivery is telling you that you're using a lap pad. You have hit the start button on the lap pad, but the red knob is in any other position other than run or calibration. So you have to have the red knob in the run in order to start a delivery from the lap pad. Now, temperature error is, is a, a, a temperature compensation error. It's telling you that, that you are not reading a temperature. Usually when you see a temperature error, you can go into the lap pad and you'll either see 999 uh, point 0.9 is a temperature or you'll see dashes. Okay, what it's telling us is that point is is the resistance that the board is reading for the temperature probe is way above what it what it should normally be. Okay, it's not reading that temperature. Uh, the VCF domain error. Uh, in temperature compensation, we have tables that have a range, uh, typically from somewhere around 40 degrees below zero all the way up to um, positive 140 degrees Fahrenheit. You will get an, a VCF domain error if the temperature is above those ranges. Um, it's very, very unlikely that you would be delivering a product that either, is either above or below those. So typically what happens with something like that, when we see these VCF domain errors, is we either have some sort of uh, corrosion on the board um, at the temperature probe connection, uh, or something has happened to the wiring for the temperature probe. Uh, so those are two common uh, issues with the domain error. Uh, pulsar failure, uh, a pulsar failure, 
on the newer models uh, with with what we consider the gold and black pulsar, uh, we typically don't see pulsar failures anymore because it's a different technology than the older one. So if you have a an LCR out there with the old red and gray pulsar, uh, that is what we consider an optical pulsar. So uh, those, if you do get some sort of debris in the disc sets that are inside, uh, the register knows what pulse to expect as it's coming in from the pulsar. If it doesn't see that specific wave for pulses coming in, it will start counting up pulsar faults, and then it will actually go into a pulsar failure. So if you do see a pulsar failure, this is pretty typical, uh, an absolute pulsar uh, failure. So in that case, uh, replace the pulsar itself. So the, the meter calibration error uh, just means that you don't have a K factor. You don't have a pulses per unit uh, entered into the product uh, that you're trying to make a delivery on. A um, very common mistake would be for somebody to go ahead and, and set up a product number one uh, with all the product information, you know, calibrated, everything's good to go. Uh, and then they, they inadvertently change it from product number one to product number two, and then go ahead and disconnect a lap pad and somebody tries to make delivery using their red knob and nothing happens. Well, they print off a diagnostic ticket and it says meter calibration error. Uh, and, and that's because product number two was never set up. It didn't have a pulses per unit in there. Uh, so it, it's going to give you this meter calibration error. Um, also, you may see that uh, after a clear all too, uh, because it does wipe all that information out. Uh, so you may see it as well there. Uh, power fail error. Uh, power fail error means that during a delivery, so you, you've started a delivery, you've had your counter reset, You've pumped some product and all of a sudden the register loses power. Uh, it has to lose power for more than 15 seconds. And if it does that, when when you do power the register back up, what's going to happen is it's going to automatically end the, the delivery. It's going to kick the ticket out of the printer if you've got a printer attached to it. And it's going to give you the message, fault print diagnostic message. Well, when you go into the diagnostic menu and you actually look at the messages in there, you're going to see this power fail error, meaning that it lost power for more than 15 seconds in the middle of a delivery. Now, if let's say you start a delivery and the register loses power but regains power within that 15 seconds, what will happen is it'll, it will not end the delivery, but you may have to take the red knob, go back down to stop and back up in a run to resume that delivery. Okay, so uh, if it's less than 15 seconds, it won't automatically end the delivery. Uh, check printer and cable. Uh, basically, all this is telling us is that between uh, the register and the printer, we're, we've lost communication. So the register can no longer see uh, the printer itself. It could be that the printer isn't turned on. It could be that there's no paper uh, in the printer. Um, a common uh, a common failure of the printer is the release light will be flashing, indicating that it's not getting the required 24 volts that it needs to operate correctly. So if you see that, you'll get this check printer and cable. Uh, it could be something as simple as the printer cable came loose. Um, or it could be, uh, like I was talking about in the installation side, uh, you, you know, nobody put a protective uh, conduit around the cable and uh, a rack got thrown up or uh, something came up and nicked a cable and actually cut some of the internal uh, conductors in there. Uh, and we lost power to the, or we lost communication to the printer, but, but that's what it's telling you. And then a gross preset stop, um, it, 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 could, it, it basically will come up um, as a message for like a corrosion on the board, uh, it's more of a memory issue than it is really anything to do with a gross preset, um, unless you are using gross presets. If you, if you enter a gross preset, uh, you will see a gross preset stop. But if you are temperature compensating and you're not using a lap pad uh, and you do get this message, chances are you've got some sort of corruption uh, in the board. Uh, it could be some sort of corrosion or moisture damage. Uh, on it. An initializing warning uh, that typically happens when you do do a clear all 
um, if there is some issues with memory, you'll you'll typically get this initializing warning. Uh, if it keeps continuing to come up over and over again, uh, a clear all may not fix it. So the best thing to do at that point would be to replace the main board. So some of the common scenarios that we would go through, uh, you know, a common common phone call for us is, you know, the meter's not working. Um, you know, the first thing that we're going to really ask is, is does the counter test, does it go through a reset? And, and, and when we said reset and test, we don't mean just go back to zero, okay? When we mean a counter test, we actually want to see the digits flash up all the characters. So you're going to see it flash eight, and then you're going to see it go back to zero when you actually get a real reset, okay? That means that the register is, is in a working mode, okay? So we want to make sure that we actually see that reset and test of the counter, not just go to zero. Okay? Um, you know, if it if it does reset, uh, that's when we need to start checking some of the outputs on the solenoid. Uh, you know, if there's a valve in place, maybe we need to start looking at the valve. Um, if it doesn't, um, if it doesn't go ahead and go through the counter test, that's telling it that the that that LCR is in some sort of a failure mode. Um, when we start a delivery on an LCR2, it goes through a few different checks before it actually initializes um, a delivery. You know, make sure that there's a K factor there. If there's temperature compensation, it makes sure that there's a good reading on the temperature probe. If a ticket's required, it makes sure that the ticket printer can be seen. And it also checks to make sure that there's a ticket in that printer. So it does go through a few different checks. Uh, before the delivery is actually initiated. So if if we're not getting that test of the counter, um, we can print off a diagnostic ticket because there should be some sort of diagnostic message uh, in the register telling us why it's not starting a delivery. Uh, so we can do this right away and it should give us some information. Um, again, if, if, if it doesn't print any tickets, then that's kind of an indication that it may be an issue between the register and the printer uh, not communicating. So now we can't even get a diagnostic ticket out of it. So uh, in that case, I would recommend that you start looking uh, between the register and printer at the cabling, make sure that's all tight and secure uh, and nothing has come loose and that the printer is, is, is powered on and there's a ticket in there. So some of the power issues, um, you know, if there's no display, the first thing you can always look at is, is see if there's a backlight. Um, sometimes you may have to put your hand over the display a little bit to see if there is a backlight. Um, if there is a backlight, then we can kind of go on and, and start checking some other uh, some other things as far as as is the board working. Um, if there is not a backlight, then we need to start looking uh, at power. You know, is the fuse good? Uh, is the cable good? Is the power cable running in some sort of a protective conduit? Uh, is it powered up good from the uh, fuse box? Uh, could you have a bad ground? There's a lot of things there that, that could cause uh, the register not to power up uh, that we'd have to look into. Um, and then, um, yeah, and also make sure that the, the the battery we don't have any kind of shorts or 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 anything like that, and and with the battery as well, make sure that the truck is charged up if that's the case. Um, one thing I also want to note here too, when when speaking about power and the register, uh, avoid um, avoid jump starting a truck when the register is actually connected to the battery or to the fuse panel. OK, if you do have to jump a truck, I would highly recommend that you uh, remove the power for the LCR so that way uh, the register doesn't see that voltage spike when you're charging a truck uh, to jump a truck. Uh, so so make sure that you do disconnect that when when you do uh, if you ever have to jump start your truck. Again, uh, power failure, we kind of went through that a little bit already. Um, you just want to check on pins 11 and 12 here to make sure that you're you're above that nine volt DC coming into the board. Uh, one thing I would definitely recommend is, is if you are having power issues to check uh, the power at the board itself, 
Okay, on pin 11 and 12, that's going to be your voltage coming in. So, uh, you know, you could check in a fuse box and, and get good 12 volts. But, you know, let's say you got a little short in the cable somewhere where you're leaking some voltage out. You go back to the register and you, you, you check the voltage there and you're only getting six volts. So you always want to make sure that you check it at the register, uh, not at the fuse box or wherever you're getting power from. And the Epson release light flashes, um, kind of went over this a little bit about it. Uh, the most common uh, issue where we see that is that 12 to 24 volt power converter. Uh, it's that little box in the power uh, for the printer. Uh, that is typically the culprit when uh, we're not getting the required 24 volts out um, uh, to power that printer. Uh, and if you don't have a power, the biggest thing is make sure that the switch is on. There is a switch on there that from time to time, somebody may brush up against an, an apps and accidentally turn the printer off. So uh, if it's not powering up, just, just make sure that that printer power is on. Um, if you're having other issues with the printer too, at that point in time, uh, you know, changing the printer to a known good working printer uh, to see if that resolves the problem is always the, the easiest way to troubleshoot some of these components here. Now, I, I do get calls from this on time to time where, where somebody will say, I'm getting some sort of an error with the register. It's printing out a whole bunch of garbage on my on my tickets. And, and I'll ask him, I'll say, okay, well, what does it say? And he says, you know, somebody will say, it's just nothing but gibberish on there. Well, if you press and hold the release light on the Epson printer and power it up, what it's going to do is it's going to put it into a self-test mode. And what happens as soon as you put a ticket in, you're going to get something that looks like this ticket here uh, on the right side. So you're going to get some information about the serial interface. You're going to get some information about buffer capacity. But below that, what you're actually looking at is it's printing every single character that it can print and just moving it over one spot to the left every single time it prints a new line. So you, it looks like a bunch of gibberish, but really what it is is it's just going through a self-diagnostics. Um, so what it does, it, it takes about three sheets, three standard tickets to print this completely off. Once it does that, then it'll go right back into normal operating mode. So, you know, a driver leans onto the printer, accidentally pushes down a release light with his elbow, turns his truck on, and all of a sudden it starts printing a bunch of, a bunch of gibberish on the ticket. Uh, this is typically what happens. So uh, just keep that in mind that, that this is, you know, it's their self-diagnostics for uh, the ticket printer. Okay, so for a temperature error, uh, what you wanna do uh, is on pin 21 and 22 and then 20 and 23. So basically any red wire to any white wire is kind of the rule of thumb. And what you wanna see on our temperature probe is 100 ohms plus or minus 20, depending on the temperature. Okay, the warmer the temperature is outside or the warmer the product temperature is, the higher the resistance reading. The lower the temperature, the lower the, your resistance reading is. And one thing you want to make sure that you do is you want to make sure that you pull that terminal block off the board before you check it for resistance. Okay, the reason being is because that board does provide some resistance for the internal circuitry for the temperature circuit, and we don't want to take that as a reading into, into consideration when we're checking the probe for correct uh, ohms reading. So you want to make sure that you just pull that off the board and check it from any, any white wire to any red wire, and you should get right around that 100 ohms plus or minus 20. Uh, pulsar failures uh, kind of went through this a little bit again with the um, with the old red and gray one a pulsar failure is a little bit more common uh, because that's an optical sensor uh, pulsar whereas this newer one the black and gold one is more of a position indicator uh, it's not a a true per se optical pulsar anymore so the pulsar faults really don't happen um, with the new black and gold one uh, usually when they fail, what happens is they just won't count right away. Okay, so you'll start a delivery and, and you'll be pumping fuel and, and you won't get any kind of registration on it. That's the way that the new uh, black and gold ones will, will fail over the older ones.
and this is another shot from the the manual itself for the LCR manual itself. Uh, but the way that you can actually check the pulser is, is pin 32 is is our five volts for the the internal pulser itself. So if you go from your power pin 32 in this case to any one of the channels, okay, the pulser channels are going to be pin 33 and pin 34. Okay, it's typically a a white and green wire. What you're really looking for is you're looking for about half of the voltage of the input uh, on the channels in the middle of a delivery. So let me explain that a little bit more. So let's say you're using pin 32 to power up your pulse, or you get five volts there. Okay, if you go from pin 32 to pin 33 without without a delivery being active, with the pulser not turning, you should either get zero or five volts, depending on the position of the pulser. So zero five volts would be good. The same with pin 34. Between 32 and 34, you should either get zero or five volts. Uh, nothing in between. It should be either zero or five. Now, when you go ahead and you start a delivery and you check with your voltmeter between pin 32 and 33, because of the fact that the pulser puts out a 50% duty cycle square wave, you should see roughly two and a half volts on your voltmeter. Because what it's doing is it's taking the average of the pulse. So pulse goes low, it goes down to zero volts. When it goes high, it goes up to five volts. It's doing this many times a second, uh, and it takes the average of that reading. So you should get right around two and a half volts. Okay, so the same thing on pin 32 and 34. You should see roughly half of the input voltage. Okay, so if you're using five volts input, uh, you should see that two and a half volts. Also, if you change it all the way up to 12 volts, the pulser can run on 12 volts, then you're going to be looking at six volts as your uh, voltage between your power and pin 33 and then power and pin 34. Okay? And remember, that's in an active delivery with the pulser turning. The pulser has to be turning in order for you to see that, that half of a voltage. And again, because that's because of the 50% duty cycle of that pulse. Um, let's see what else we got here. So, um, valve. Okay, so you go ahead, you start a delivery, your counter goes through its counter test. Uh, you do hear a click, but the valve doesn't open. Okay, usually that click indicates that the poppet in the solenoid is moving, but we can't always be, be guaranteed that that's the issue. So, what we can do is we can actually test to see if we're getting a good output from the board. So your, your S1 uh, solenoid is located on pins 14 and 15. Okay, that is your S1 output. Uh, what you can do is you can check between uh, any ground and pin 14, and you should always have voltage on pin 14. Okay, So between ground and pin 14, no matter what condition uh, the delivery is in, you should always have 12 volts there or 24 volts, uh, depending on your power input. Pin 15 is actually our signal for our solenoid. Uh, on pin 15, there's a little transistor on the board that actually acts as a switch and gives us a ground on that pin when the delivery is initiated. Okay, so what's going to wind up happening is, is when you're not in an active delivery, your red knob is either on print or stop. If you check from ground to pin 14, you'll get 12 volts. Also on pin 15, between ground and pin 15, you'll get 12 volts okay, in the stop or print mode. When you actually reset the delivery, you get the counter test come up, you'll see the voltage on pin 15 go very close to zero volts. You may have a couple of tenths of a volt. Okay, that's telling you that you are getting a good ground on pin 15, which is actually um, energizing your coil on your solenoid. Now, I say that it's it's actually energized your coil, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your valve is open, okay? All it means is that we have current flowing through the coil, okay? If you're still not able to make a delivery, it could be a stuck poppet, it could be something else wrong with, with the valve itself that we'll get into a little bit later. Now, 17 and 18 uh, is our S2, so that's only going to take effect if we're doing any kind of preset deliveries, 
So if you're doing preset deliveries and your valves are just slamming shut, uh, you're not going into a low flow. The first thing that you want to check is to make sure that you do have an S1 closure set. Um, if you do have an S1 closure set, then the same rules will apply to 17 and 18 uh, that do on 14 and 15. 17 is always going to have voltage, so you're always going to have power there in reference to a ground. Pin 18 is actually going to be the signal. This is where we're actually going to get the ground uh, to allow current to flow through the coil on the S2 solenoid. Okay, but keep in mind that that S2 solenoid will only activate when the S1 closure is reached on your preset. So you can't really go check that during a normal delivery because it's not going to be active. So just keep that in mind. Some of the old ones, um, I don't know how many guys are going to be out there uh, with some of these older displays, um, but some of the older displays, uh, if you remember back where I showed the very first screen, where the register on the left had the display sitting up on two posts. Some of those very old ones that are still out in the field working today actually have a nine volt lithium battery inside the display. So if you've got an, an old one that looks like that, uh, that class one div one uh, and you're not getting it to display, the first thing is, is to take those four screws off, off the front cover of the display and see if there's a battery in it. Uh, because that battery does drive the L LCD in there. So just have to make sure that um, we check that. Uh, the newer ones, the, the ones with the door, um, if it doesn't have a display, um, they, they communicate a little bit differently now than they did in the past, whereas the past LCRs were just basically what I consider a dummy counter. All the displays did is count up or count down depending on the pulses that were being fed into it. With the LCR2, we actually send it a digital signal. So we send it a value for its volume. Okay, We're not sending it just raw pulses anymore. So the display could go blank. There is a little bit of memory in there that it does hold the last delivery volume in, in the display itself. If that memory, for some reason, by powering on or powering off um, at the right time, if that memory is wiped clean in the display, the display can remain blank until the CPU board tells it to display something. So if you power up your truck and all of a sudden you go out there and you notice that, oh, hey, there's no display on the front of my register, but I do get a backlight. It very well could be that the, the display lost its memory and because the, the CPU hasn't started a new delivery, and doesn't have anything for the display to, to actually show, it may remain blank until you restart a delivery. So if you see that, the, the first thing to do would be to go ahead and, and take your red knob and move it up into the run position or start a delivery however you may actually start your delivery and see if your display lights up. As soon as it goes into a counter test, it should light the display up uh, and go from there. So just keep that in mind that if you do see a blank display, the first thing that we're going to ask you to do would be to, to have you started a new delivery. Um, if you have started a new delivery using either lap pad or the red knob and it's still not, uh, it, it still hasn't lit up, then we could have one of three different issues going on. Uh, we could have a bad display. We could have a bad phone cord inside or a little curly cord uh, that goes between the CPU board and the display. Or in, in my experience, more likely a bad CPU board uh, where either a bad connection or a component failed on the board uh, and we're not getting that signal up to the display from the CPU. So um, the easiest way to, to troubleshoot that would, would definitely be to, to, to replace the door and see if the display lights up when you start a new delivery. Um, and then also the phone cord. If uh, you replace the door, uh, and the phone cord and you're still getting uh, no display, then chances are it's going to be that CPU board. So uh, in my experience, that's typically where I see the issues. OK, so for the lap pad, um, Atik did kind of touch on this a little bit. You know, somebody can plug in a lap pad to, to an adapter or the MUX box and they're not getting anything. Uh, in that case, they have to make sure that the jumpers are in the right position. So on the new board, uh, the blue board with the AB uh, jumper, we need to make sure that they're in the A position. And also make sure that if these are running any kind of a handheld device, 
Uh, you have to make sure that uh, the, the violet and the red wire uh, are actually on pins 46 and 48. Uh, a lot of times uh, when, when handheld devices are being used, they're communicating in a 45 mode. So the jumper will be in the B position and then also the red wire from pin 46 will be on 24 and the violet wire will be from pin 48 to pin 25. So uh, in order to work with a lap pad, if you're using that cable, you'll have to move those two wires over. So those are the, the, the most, common, uh, most common issues. Um, with the lap pad not working. So just make sure that you check that kind of stuff. Um, I really don't think I had any more than that. Um, I think that should pretty much do it. Uh, for We went a little bit over, but um, if there is any questions, I, I would assume that now is the time that we would start them. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, and uh, again, I apologize. We are a little bit over time, but we certainly want to open up the floor um, feel free to either raise your hand using the raise your hand button or you can unmute yourself if nobody's talking and and ask a question. We'll hang out here for a little while uh, and try and address any questions anybody has. But uh, if you don't feel comfortable in this environment asking a question, uh, please feel free to email anybody on the technical services team. Myself, Jeff Hageman, Bill Eswell, T, uh, Tom or Juan, any of those guys are going to be able to address your questions uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis as well. But with that, we'll go ahead and open it up uh, for questions, uh, if anybody has any. Uh, if not, uh, that's the end of the presentation. And uh, like I said, we'll be here for a little while to address any questions. Okay, it looks like John's got his hand up. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, John. Hi, John. Okay. Earlier, you were talking about um, the checks that the LCR2 does before it um, actually gets going. And one of those was the check that the printer is connected and then also that there's a ticket in the printer. Yes. Um, so what, what does it do in the case where the printer is not the old style Epson printer with the insertable ticket, but it's a, it's, it's a roll printer that has a continuous roll in it? Um, how does that compute? Yeah, the, it's it's still going to look for the same conditions. Um, the the roll printer in the roll printer, there is a a switch. Um, if you actually pull the roll printer out and you look inside there, there's like a little lever that gets pushed in when you insert the roll of paper in there. And in order for the ticket to be ready, that uh, that little switch has to be uh, pushed in. So there has to be a roll of, of paper in there, and then it does have to be loaded correctly. So. If, if you're on a roll printer, it will still give you a paper out light. So it, it's the same thing with the slip ticket as you would see on the roll printer. So it still needs to be powered up and it still needs to have a, a, a roll of paper in there in order for it to give back a, a ready to go kind of signal. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. All right, sure, you're welcome. Hey, Bill, it's Jeff. I had a question come in here via email while we're talking here. It was from uh, uh, one of our customers down in Florida asking about uh, when a lap hat's connected to a dual, dual meter multiplex box and you're not getting any printer signal. Are, are there any settings you have to do inside the multiplex box? You, you mean a, a, a printer signal or with the, with the, the lap pad? Right, for the lap with, the, with the lap pad, yes. There are a set of jumpers in the uh, MUX box that do... Uh, convert it from a 232 to a 45 mode. So if they are using a handheld device and, and it is being plugged into the lap pad port on the MUX box from their handheld, uh, chances are they do have it set up for 45. So you would have to open it up and then uh, change those jumpers over to the 232 settings for that lap pad to work. Um, and, and that's where the, uh, the, the, the MUX box manual uh, there's a nice little diagram in there showing exactly how those jumpers should be positioned. So uh, it, it it does need to be changed in a mux box as well. Yeah, and if, if we revert back to the beginning of Antique's presentation, he talked about you know having a, a flash cable or a, that that cable also connected to the lap pad. If you are just hooking up a lap pad for a multiplex box for troubleshooting purposes, and you don't want to have to get in and move all those jumpers. That's a great reason to have a, a flash cable around so you can just connect directly to the register, to each individual register and bypass the multiplex box. So, 
So keep keep that in mind as you're as you're working on systems with dual meter. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and, and and they can also just disconnect the cable come from the back of the back of the MUX box and put a lap hat adapter on there. As long as the register is configured for 232, and it's the jumpers in the A position, they can bypass the MUX box that way with an adapter as well. Great. Uh, so I see this question from Alex here. Um, it's saying, can we talk real quick about the fonts best for the roll printer and the slip printer? Uh, the you still out there? Would you like to yeah, take that? Yeah, I can, I can cover that. Uh, basically, these are the most common two printers uh, which people use, slip printer or roll printer. If you're using LCR2 or LCR600, uh, old font A, we use it for the slip printer, and new font B, we use it for the roll printer. Yeah. It, it, if you reference um, like the online manuals, we didn't bring it up again in this training, but you know all the manuals are available in two formats on our website. So we have the PDF version, you know, the printable version. We also have the online version that you can look up, you know, manuals on your on your phone. Uh, if you're in the LCR2 manual and you look under that section for printer type, uh, you'll see where it mentions, you know, Epson old font A, new font A, old font B, new font B. Uh, next to that, it will tell you which models of printer that is recommended for each one of those fonts. Uh, so on the LCR2, the best way to figure that out if you're not 100% sure is to reference that manual. But like Atik said, the two most common are Epson Old Font A for the slip printer and then Epson New Font B for the uh, for the roll printer. Uh, the third option that we see a lot of is the uh, if you're using the Epson Thermal Printer, the T88 series. Uh, that would be Epson New Font A if you're looking to use that one. But uh, again, reference that manual online. If you look up that, you can do a quick search once you pop up the manual on your mobile phone. Uh, and in the search, you can type printer type, and that will take you right to that section. And you'll be able to reference, you know, which printer type is good for which printer. Yeah, and I can I can go a little bit further with it too. The, the biggest difference between the slip printer roll printer is the number of characters that they can print on each line. If you if you have the the roll printer hooked up and you have your uh, printer type set to the old font A for a roll or for a slip printer, what's going to happen is you're actually going to wrap the text below to the next line. Uh, the reason being is the slip printer has the capability of printing out 35 characters per line. Whereas the, the, the roll printer can only do 33 characters per line. So if you have it set to a, 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 a slip printer and you're using a roll printer, what's going to happen is it's going to take the last two characters and actually wrap them below. So if you ever put a, a roll printer on and you're getting some weird looking ticket where it looks like everything's all spaced out, chances are that's why, because it's set to the slip printer uh, for the 35 characters, but it only has the ability to print 33, so it wraps the text around. So since we're still here too, I had a couple of things too I kind of wanted to talk about unless we got another question. Um, okay, so one of the a couple of common things that we kind of see uh, right now in the field. Um, when somebody tries to print off a, a shift report, a shift ticket, um, you know, they'll take their red knob, go down into the shift report, nothing prints out. So the ticket printer is good, the power's on, the, there's no release light flashing, you know, uh, no paper out light is on, everything looks good. Um, go down to shift print, nothing prints out. They take their red knob, they move it up into the stop, and as soon as they do that, they get a diagnostic ticket out of it. OK, uh, this is something that that is affected by the date and time. So if all of a sudden you go to print off a shift report and nothing prints and you move the red knob and you get a diagnostic ticket, check your date and time. Chances are that your date and time has been reset. OK, and, and what's happening is the the LCR when it started the, the shift at a good date and time of, you know, let's say, you know, a, a day ago or this morning or whatever it may be. But during that shift, the date and time may have somehow been reset to a previous date and time. Well, what happens is the register gets confused because it can't really calculate a shift because of the, the end of the shift 
is actually before the beginning of the ship. So it doesn't know what to do with it. So in that case, it prints you out a diagnostic ticket. So if you do see that where it won't print a shift report, but you do get a diagnostic ticket, check your date. I, the, the, the chances of the date being reset to some previous value is, is, is going to be there. Great. Does anybody else uh, that's still out there uh, have any other questions? We'll give it another minute or so here. Yeah, I can kind of, I, I got another point here that, oh, somebody had a question there? I don't see one though. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, another another thing that we have, we've seen out in the field uh, recent times too is um, somebody will be making a delivery, um, everything will be pumping just fine, and then all of a sudden the valve just shuts off and and the delivery stops. Um, it doesn't print off a a, a delivery ticket uh, indicating that the register went into a failure mode, uh, but all it does is just shut down the solenoids. Um, in my experience, what I've seen. Uh, it is some sort of a grounding issue somewhere. What happens is uh, during the delivery, the register has lost power for just a fraction of a second. And it could be quick enough to where you don't even see the display blank out or blink or anything. It looks like the delivery was going just fine and then just all of a sudden stopped. Well, a good test would be to take the red knob, go to the stop position, and then go back up in a run and see if the delivery continues from right where it left off. If it does, chances are we have some sort of a grounding issue uh, between the, the register and the battery, uh, the negative battery terminal of the truck itself. Um, now, I've, I've had a few cases to where what I've done is I've, I've suggested that they extend the ground wire, just the ground wire, from the fuse box all the way to the negative terminal of the battery. And in every one of those situations where we've done that, we have not seen the problem reoccur. So it could be a grounding either on the firewall or in a chassis someplace or we're getting a bad connection on the actual battery terminal itself. Um, but if you do see that, and the important thing is, is, is if the delivery, if the delivery shuts off, but it does not print the delivery ticket off, then I would start looking at a bad ground using that test, go to stop and go back and run to see if it goes, if it continues from right where it left off. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Bill. Um, you know, the, the best ground, if we're talking about a mobile installation, we're on a truck. The best ground on that truck is always going to be that negative post of the battery. Uh, you know, I've been on countless service calls over the last 25 years and, and found that, uh, you know, the ground for the for the main power for the LCR is right to the chassis, along with, you know, a hose reel and about five other things like a lift gate or something else. And, you know, any noise on that ground, especially on the chassis, is going to be affecting it, that register as well or could potentially affect that register. So. You know, if you're out there doing these installations with any of any electronic register, it doesn't matter whether it's liquid controls or anybody else for that matter, is that, you know, your power and your ground are the two most important things to make that electronic register operate. So, uh, and that ground is really going to be the key. You know, just going to the chassis, yeah, it will work in a lot of cases, but really the best option is always to get to that negative post to the battery whenever you can. I know it's not always convenient, takes a little extra time, maybe a couple extra holes you have to run and a little more cable, but you're always going to get your best results when you go to the negative post of the battery. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions from uh, any guests here? I don't see any others. Again, if you're not comfortable in this forum asking a question, please uh, reach out to anyone on the technical services team, myself, uh, Atik, Bill, uh, Tom, Juan. Uh, we're here to uh, answer your questions. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, sitting in and joining us today. Don't forget uh, next week, uh, June 23rd, uh, is going to be around calibration for both mechanical and electronic registers, you know, kind of a deep focus on that. So. Uh, we're looking forward to that. I know there's a lot of people that were interested in that subject, so uh, expecting a, a large group for that class. So 
if there aren't any further questions, I wish everybody a great day or evening, and uh, we'll see you at the next session. So thank you very much for attending. Thanks. Yep, thank you, everyone. Thank you.